and welcome to the album man. And as you can probably see by, well, the beginning, that I am reviewing Bat Out of Hell 2 by Meatloaf. And this is the direct sequel to the original, yet, as the first had no real coherent or narrative, really, um, it really just continues the various themes and, yeah, it's a continuation thematically more than actual story wise. However, like the first album, though, this does have quite a checkered history. I mean, this was released in 1993, and the original was in 1977, so that's a good 16 years between them. So why did it take this long? Well, after the phenomenal success of the first one, the record company demanded that Steinman started to produce a follow-up, which was tentatively titled Renegade Angel. And due to various reasons, including Meat losing his voice, which happened after the Battle of Hell or that, that tour took a lot of toll on his voice, and it's really never been quite the same since. Um, Steinman, however, he wanted people to hear these songs, so put them on his solo album, Bad for Good, and even put a couple on the Pandora, on the band Pandora's box, um, their album original Sin, which was a bit of a commercial flop. And now that band Pandora's box, in, I think, was an all-girl group put together by Steinman, and was not that successful, really. However, in the early 90s, the spectacular duo of Meat and Jim recorded the follow-up to one of Rock's greatest and most over-the-top albums. But does it really live up to this standard set? I mean, this is bat out of hell that it's following up anyway. So anyway, it kicks off the famous, I'd do anything for love, but I won't do that. And, yeah, I mean, this really takes away any doubt people had. I mean, it should have been shoved aside when it had this 12-minute epic. I mean, this is Steinman we're talking about, so it's not exactly going to be a short song, or album for that matter. And it starts with the sound of a motorcycle created on a guitar, like, I don't know, a certain title track we looked up before. And then you get a nice long intro, which, hmm, reminds you of anything? I mean, then Roy Bitten's roaring piano with guitar over the top before the voice of Meat comes over. And for the first chorus, it really shows how it seems to link perfectly to the first album. And it's very much the same style as the last album. It has that exceptionally catchy chorus with uh, that signature operatic style or feel even from Steinman. And even though the song is pretty long, it suits it. It changes pace enough to keep itself fresh and interesting. Especially the duet at the end with Lorraine Crosby, who is simply credited as Mrs. Loud on the actual, like, linear notes. And her voice works really well with Meats. They, they complement each other fantastically. And I do love the duet Steinman writes, like, of course, on Paradise by the Dashboard Light, my favourite Meatloaf song. And, of course, there's the famous what will... what is the thing that he won't do, as it's always referred to, and I won't do that. Well, I think I have an answer to... Well, it is. It's never been answered by Steinman or Meat, but I, I think I have an idea. You see, I think, actually, it's a reference to Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You Up. So the thing that he won't do is clearly, well, give her up. So, then we get to Life is a Lemon and I Want My Money Back. Now, this, this is one of my favourite song titles of all time. I mean, Life is a Lemon and I Want My Money Back. How bloody good is that as a title? And the force of the fact that the phrase is repeated in the chorus just makes this song epic, no matter what else it contains. Though, it does contain some pretty epic stuff as well. I mean, it's an eight-minute song, and it's one of those that just builds and builds. And for me, it's actually a pretty heavy song featuring an awesome, even quite ominous-sounding guitar riff. And it does, to me, have quite a dark sound, certainly for Meatloaf and for Steinman to write. And it is an unexpected change of pace. It's different, but probably one of my faves from the album, and it has an awesome guitar solo as well. However, Rock and Roll Dreams Come True doesn't come through even. Doesn't quite match the standard. It was originally released on Steinman's solo album sung by Rory Dodd, not Steinman, though it's un uncredited. Um, this song, to me, it just doesn't stand out, except for the killer sax solo. It's, that's awesome. I do think it's a good song, it's just not quite up to the standards of the previous songs and the songs on the first album. Is calling this album a sequel, it, do, it is going to 
draw direct comparison to the original. I, you know, I can't avoid that. It's you know telling me to effectively. And I mean, it has that over top, over the top sound of Steinman and some great backing vocals. It just feels more like a B side to me in a way. I find it hard to describe, but it just doesn't click. It just won't quit was on that mediocre girl band Pandora's box flop of an album. Here though, this song provides a nice ballady sound... ballady? Uh, I don't know. It's slightly slower than the previously pretty up-tempo songs, but it's not really a ballad, to be honest. Maybe a powery, heavy ballad? I, I don't know, I'm just making up phrases to go ballad now. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's a pretty cool song. Uh, the piano is, guess what, it's sublime. I mean, it's right bitten, enough said. And, yeah, I like the song a lot. Damn nice vibe to it. And some extraordinary guitar work as well as building so dramatically that it takes away any notion of it really being related to a ballad, to be honest. Yeah, um, there, there are some ballads on this album, though. But, yeah, another hard-hitting Steinman classic. Out of the frying pan, into the fire. Enough of Good name. I mean, God almighty, the track names on here are just so well named. I, I love the names alone, to be honest. Um, and from the outset, this song screams orgasmic meatloaf epic. And it doesn't reveal the chorus to you for about three minutes as it just builds up to a great catchy chorus with a real Bruce Springsteen vibe out. I definitely get a big Born to Run vibe from this unrelenting song. Again, has that miniature opera sound and one of the strongest songs on the album. Now objects in the rear view mirror may appear closer than they are. This was the longest hit in the UK, well, long, sorry, not longest in song length, it was the longest in title length hit in the UK until some goddamn awful Panic at the Disco song or some shit like that. And this is a relentless power ballad, really taken to the extremes. It's a ten minute song, so there's a lot in that time, but it just starts with Meets Voice over Roy's piano. And the themes of the song centre on the seasons, winter, spring and summer, which, oh, I'm going to start getting fancy here, is an example of pathetic fallacy, as it reflects the atmosphere of what is happening. And this song, it also has a very nice reference to Paradise by the Dashboard Lap, of course, my favourite Meatloaf song, with it was long ago and it was far away, refraining throughout the song, and it fits very well, and especially thematically, as this song really tells a it takes you through a journey of torment and a tragic childhood. Um, Steinman says this is the hardest song to write, and, I mean, he pulls it off fantastically. Lyrically, it's great, and the music, it really helps to encapsulate the feeling Steinman's trying to present with the lyrics as it builds and falls, ebbs and flows. It's an epic of the original album's proportion, and enough of my favourites on the album. And... The ballad this song, this album really needed to just lift it to that, that level. Wasted Youth. This is a weird song. This is a remixing of Love and Death and an American guitar from Steinman's Bad for Good. And it's a spoken word monologue by Steinman and again references Paradise by the Dashboard Light, which is cool. As the song starts with I was barely 17, of course in Paradise by the Dashboard Light be I was barely 17 and barely dressed. But instead it's I was barely 17 and something like, um, killed a boy with a fender. Yeah, that's that's what this song is about. It's, a, it's about killing someone with a nice fender. Now, he doesn't remember if it's a Strat or a Telecaster, but I hope it was a Telecaster, because not a big fan of those. Love Strats, but Telecaster, not as much. Um, anyway, it's, it's certainly a different song, to say the least, if you can call it a song. It's, it's weird. Um... I do like it, it works pretty well. The performance from Steinman shouting, and he really sort of carries the rhythm with his voice. And then there's from whoever the synth guys, can't remember his name at the moment, um, there's basically a bit of synth and weird sound effects behind his voice. And yeah, it works very nicely. It's a very interesting song. If anything, it reminds me a little bit of, um, this is going to sound weird, it reminds me a little bit of Sonic Attack by Hawkwind. Yeah, I do love that song. That's that's a, such a funny song, but it reminds me a little bit of that actually. Um, and then we get to everything louder than everything else, which is a really bombastic song that contrasts heavily to the spoken word before, but it really follows on perfectly from "Wasted Youth" with the even the shouting of the phrase "Wasted Youth." 
And yeah, it's just another big rock opera, giant drum sound over bearing guitar, standing piano combined with catchy as hell choruses. And yeah, Meat delivers this song especially with such a power. There really is nothing to dislike about it, except maybe the random mass bagpipes in it. I don't quite get them, they just don't feel it's like, oh, the song's ended. And then you hear these bagpipes and it's like, right, you, you could have just ended it there, Stein, and the bagpipes don't really add anything, but they don't detract, I suppose, but yeah. Some songs could have been cut a little bit on this album, I will admit. Anyway, let's get to Good Girls Go to Heaven, Bad Girls Go Everywhere. Another great title. And this has some more of the delightful sax we saw in Rock and Roll Dreams Come True. And this was first released, like a couple of others, by Pandora's Box. Like, was it It Just Went Quit? I can't remember. Those, I can't even remember now which songs it was. But yeah, there were a couple released by Pandora's Box right now. Anyway, um, I can't actually have much to say about this song. I mean... It follows a similar style to the rest, it just isn't quite strong. It has a weird, weird instrumental in the middle. Uh, but the chorus is sublimely catchy, so yeah, decent song. Back into Hell, though. Mm, no, no, it's, it's another slightly strange song on the album. It's just a little two and a half, three minute instrumental, and consists of just synths from um, Jeff Bova, that's him. And I can't say I like it that much. I mean, the synths have a bloody dramatic, overbearing sound to them. And I just don't like the main synth melody, so it's really heavy synth melody. And it just feels like a place in the context of the album. I mean, I'm not the biggest synth fan in the world, and I'm not a fan of synth instrumentals. I don't even know why this was included in the album. It has... I don't see that it has massive thematic purposes, and it doesn't really feel musically that good and uh, you just may as well have been left off. I don't see why it's there. But Lost Boys and Golden Girls, quite a short song from um, Steinman, ends the album nicely. It's another ballad and on piano it's Bill Payne, not Bitten for some reason, who knows why. But it sounds lovely so that's okay. And yeah, it's a nice way to end the album. It closes it quite gently with just a, a nice catchy ballad. Just like, um, whatever the hell it was that ended the original, which I can't remember now. Anyway, this album, it may not quite soar to the heights of the original, but it is a ride back into hell that every Bat Out of Hell fan should hear. It's effectively more of that same mini-opera, overblown style, and I think it's a blast to listen to and recommend it to anyone who liked the first. However, I do have some complaints. It feels a little too long to me. I mean, it's about 75 minutes, while the first is about 45 now, it doesn't ever quite feel tedious, but they could have cut some songs, but as I was saying about the bagpipes, could have cut that, could have cut back into hell, in my opinion. They really could have shortened this down. I think if it was maybe 65 minutes, you know, it might have worked a little better. And it could be quite off-putting for people, this amount of music. And I also think this album doesn't particularly expand or innovate much on the first one. It really keeps the successful formula relatively the same, even though it's 16 years later. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, because, well, Bat Out of Hell is a monster of an album. But it might have been nice to see a, a little bit more variety musically. However, I'm going to give this a 9 out of 10. It's a classic album, but only for those who enjoyed the original. And yes, it could have been shorter. Care to use CD format, tempting bands to utilise all of you. Who knows how long albums might be if we have 100% digital. Bloody hell. Yeah. Anyway, this being the album, man. Thanks for watching. Can't read subscribe, and as usual, long live rock and roll.